Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Welcome to the Reimagine the Canals presentation. My name is Nancy Florence, and while we are waiting for the presentation to begin, I would like to provide some information regarding the presentation, um, as well as a few things of note. Everyone has been muted upon entry to eliminate any background noise and distractions. We will keep everyone muted. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat section, which will be monitored. A Q&A session will be conducted at the conclusion of this presentation. And should you have any issues regarding connectivity, audiovisual, or perhaps joined a bit late, the presentation will be recorded and posted on our New York Power Authority and Canal Corporation website. The attendee list will also be posted on our websites as well. And now to get the presentation started, I would like to introduce you to Ms. Angeline Chandler, Vice President of Planning for Reimagine Canal. Government contracts may not be on everyone's radar screen, but we think this is a very special program. The program, as I will describe shortly, is comprised of economic development and resilience projects that benefit upstate communities. The design and construction activities of those projects are also a way to benefit these communities. We want this program to provide opportunities to firms all over the state and especially to upstate firms. We want to encourage networking around this event so that small and large firms can team up for our projects. This will not only help satisfy MWBE goals, but also allow smaller firms to participate in bigger projects. Next. So a bit about the canal. For the original Erie Canal, construction began in 1817 and was completed in 1825, creating upstate towns as centers for trade and opening New York State to the West. Next. The canal was expanded several times to meet the needs of larger vessels, most notably in 1918 <coughs> when it was rerouted to take advantage of Oneida Lake and the Oswego and Mohawk Rivers which were dammed and canalized to allow ship passage. This larger canal, called the Barge Canal, also added the connecting canals of the Oswego, the Cayuga Seneca, and the Champlain. Next. Ownership of the canal has changed hands over the years, most recently in 2017, when the canal was transferred from the New York State Thruway Authority to the New York Power Authority, NYPA, and the Canal Corporation, which manages the canal, became a subsidiary of NYPA. Next. When one thinks about the canal, many people may assume there's a lot of end-to-end -end traffic. There is still through navigation and approximately 700 boaters, um, they're also called, um, through boaters, are also called loopers, make a through trip annually. 500 from Albany via the Oswego Canal go to Lake Ontario, and the remaining 200 travel end to end Albany to Buffalo. Next. Much greater use though of the canal is local usage. Of the roughly 440,000 motorized boats that travel New York State waterways, 21,000 use the canal. Of that group, 16,000 are very local boaters and do not use the locks. Over 4,000 venture further afield and use the locks. And as mentioned previously, only 700 are through boaters. Next. And most of the motorized boating activity happens in the central region. Next. The New York State Canal System today is made up of four canals the Cayuga Seneca, the Oswego, the Champlain, and the 350 mile long Erie Canal. Next. The canal is divided into three sections defined by the three watersheds that are linked by the canal, the Western, Central, and Mohawk regions. Next. The canal today and in the past only provides seasonal passage the canal is watered generally from in May and drained in late October. Next. 
There's a lot of infrastructure along the canal that is used to control water flow and allow for the passage of boats. Most of it is fully operational and is completely overhauled on a regular cycle. Next. So what is the future of the canal? The use of the canal by human-powered boats is on the rise today. Next. The Empire State Trail, which parallels the Erie Canal for much of its length, essentially following the towpath of the old Erie Canal, will be complete in the beginning of 2021. Next. There have been several plans to re-envision the Erie Canal over the years. In 2017, the canal was designated a National Historic Landmark. Next. Also in 2017, NIPA acquired the canal and Governor Cuomo launched the Reimagine the Canals competition. Some of you may have participated in that. Next. These are the seven shortlisted competition entries. Next. And two winners were announced in 2018, but many ideas put forth in the entries were further developed via a task force that was announced in May 2019. Next. The task force was comprised of agency representatives and members of key interest groups, one for each of the three regions. Next. Community meetings were held to gather information for the task force. Next. And at the beginning of this year, the task force issued a report based on their recommendations, which included identified potential new uses for the Erie Canal and its infrastructure, evaluate how the Erie Canal can support and enhance economic development, identify new opportunities to enhance recreation and tourism and connect to the Empire State Trail, assess how the Erie Canal can help mitigate impacts from flooding and ice jams to improve environmental resiliency, Discover opportunities for using canal infrastructure to expand irrigation and recreational fishing, and explore restoring wetlands and combating invasive species. This report is available on ny.gov. Next. Following the release of the task force report, Governor Cuomo announced that he was funding the Reimagine the Canals program for $300 million over five years. 100 million of that out is allocated to economic development projects and 200 million is allocated to resilience projects to prevent flooding, prevent the spread of invasive species and to restore ecosystems. Next. Approximately $25 million has been set aside for the first group of economic development projects. Several priorities for these projects have been developed, such as connect to the Empire State Trail, celebrate and repurpose historic canal infrastructure, expand water recreation, and develop unique canal site attractions, activities, and accommodations. Next. One of the one of these economic development projects is the Brockport Loop Bridge, which repurposes a guard gate on the canal as a bridge to connect the SUNY Brockport campus on one side of the canal to the Empire State Trail on the other side. Next. Our iconic lighting program lights up infrastructure along the canal in multiple locations such as lighthouses, dams, locks, rail bridges, road bridges, and guard gates. Next. This project creates a whitewater course on the Cayuga Seneca Canal. The scope includes park and visitor amenities, including picnicking, trails, fishing, car camping, and restrooms. Next. 
This is a large hospitality focused project that will have at its core the historic Guy Park Manor that could be repurposed as a restaurant or bar. Surrounding that would be developer built overnight lodging and publicly accessible park areas. The project would also utilize a movable dam as a bridge to connect the manor house area to more rustic accommodations and the Empire State Trail on the other side of the canal. Next. And then, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just pausing because um, I'm being told that the slides are moving too fast. So I'm just giving everyone a chance to re review the slide um, in its entirety while you're speaking. Okay, but again, these will post be posted on our website, so. Correct, um, Correct. yep, all right. This project was one of the two competition winners and will be a developer-built mixed-use community on the old Erie Canal. Next. Of the $200 million dedicated to resilience projects, approximately $65 million is allocated to preventing winter and summer flooding, focusing primarily on the Mohawk region. Next. And the remaining resilience funding will be allocated to an irrigation program in the Western region. Next. Expanding fishing and Western region tributaries through controlled rele releases of water from the canal. Next. And the restoration of wetlands along the canal. Next. A number of other ideas came out of the competition and are being researched and developed, such as additional measures to reduce flooding by controlling water levels, stopping the spread of aquatic invasive species, and the restoration of ecosystems along the canal. Next. So now I'd like to introduce Adam Jacoby, who is my partner in executing capital projects. He is the program director for waterway infrastructure. The next slide. So the first uh, question on many of your minds is probably, this sounds great, but where do I fit in and what contracting opportunities are available to me? Uh, so what I wanted to do is just give an overview of how these pro contracts are being let and what the structure is for the first two uh, projects. There is no set template that every single project is gonna follow. In other words, we're gonna use whatever contracting methods are most appropriate based on the type of work that we're trying to let. So one of the first projects is the Brockport Loop, and this is the area that's adjacent to SUNY Brockport near the existing guard gate that forms the end of the 60-mile pool. So the power authority will do, is directly employing the owner's architect who will provide the overall strategic vision and uh, interface with the community in terms of what they can expect for the project. Separately, we'll engage through an open competitive bid an engineer of record that will design the bridge in detail, including all of the structural members, the footings, the connections to the Brockport Loop, and the Empire uh, Canalway Trail. NIPA will also directly contract with the construction contractor through the design bid build delivery method after permits are approved and we've achieved 100% design drawings. Separately, Throughout the construction, the Canal Corporation, because work is being done on their property, will have construction inspectors that will keep tabs on what's going on day to day around their site. You can go to the next uh, slide. In the second set of contracts related to the iconic lighting system that Angela mentioned, we're using a slightly different approach. While we have also the strategic vision being provided by a contractor who's directly reporting to NIPA, 
will also have an implementation contractor through a design bid build arrangement through an existing set of value contracts held by NIPA within their energy services division. Separately, again, because this is being done on canal-owned structures, canals will have, through their set of value contracts, a construction inspector. So the things to watch out for are the open competitive bids for the one-off projects, like the engineer of record for the Brockport Bridge, but then also as value contracts are renewed, which they're required to be every five years, Keep in mind that some of the services that may be called for under those value contracts may be different than what they were the last time they were let. So I hope that gives some overview of how the first two projects are being let and to go into more contracting opportunities and discussion, I'll turn things back over to Nancy Florence. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning again, everyone. My name is Nancy Florence, and I am one of the many procurement representatives within the SSM department. And today I will address four main topics with you. And uh, those topics are solicitation mechanism, responding to a solicitation, the evaluation process, and bidder responsibilities. Okay, so solicitation mechanisms. The authority utilizes different mechanisms to identify and qualify potential suppliers, solicit bids, and ultimately engage them in project opportunities. The following are the key mechanisms currently used. So we use RFIs. The RFI is a request for information. This process is an informal process used to solicit general information about the suppliers, certain products, services, technologies, and capabilities, as well as gather market intelligence and other useful information for the authority. This mechanism is used for information purposes only. The RFQ. The RFQ is a request for qualification. This process is used to select prospective bidders. For complex or large projects or for new technologies, the authority may opt to qualify uh, suppliers prior to the issuance of a formal proposal. Pricing is not requested and is not a consideration during this RFQ process. The RFP, as I'm sure you are all aware of and familiar with, the RFP is a request for proposal. This process is a formal process and it's used to solicit proposals for specified scopes of work. These will either be issued as open bids in which case the opportunity will be publicly advertised or will be directed to a pool of potential suppliers identified through the RFQ process, those who have been qualified. Our RFPs basically tell all bidders, our door is open, come and make your best case. This now leads to the next topic, responding to a solicitation. So responding to the authority solicitation must be submitted through our Ariba system. And my associate, Emery, will be talking more about the Ariba system and the process in this presentation. But assistance in navigating Ariba is provided by Ariba and by the authority, okay? Uh, standard requirements for the uh, solicitation, responding to the solicitation, and I, I just uh, put a few up on the screen, such as qualifications and experience, which examines relevant experience, demonstrated resources, equipment, capability, and other qualifications specific to the work. Um, another key item is safety culture and past performance. Safety is important to the authority, as I'm sure is just as important to you as well. The bidder may be asked to include a comprehensive project-specific health and safety plan. Um, along with that, our, we do have a, our en environmental health and safety department, and they assist us in determining and evaluating safety concerns and records, uh, contract terms and conditions. The standard and specific terms and conditions, uh, which we call commercial, um, with, such as uh, insurance requirements, liquidated damages, payment terms, and other clauses pertaining to the project are included in the RFP. 
financial viability and credit worthiness. Uh, audited financials for the last three to five years um, or however many number of years it will be stated in the formal proposal um, is often required in addition to demonstrating credit worthiness to support the project in addition to bonding capacity. Um, the terms and lengths of our project vary. Uh, so we evaluate financials to make sure that the bidders are capable to financially support our project. Um, subcontracting goals. The bidder's commitment to meet and or exceed diversity subcontracting goals are set forth in the RFP and are very important. Uh, my associate Vicki will discuss this topic further during uh, the presentation as well. So we have more in store. The evaluation process. The evaluation process is uh, sectioned into different uh, items, such as commercial terms and conditions, technical requirements, and cost evaluation. Now, commercial can include safety, as I just mentioned, company stability, and completeness of your proposal. A complete proposal is important for the evaluation team. So you are, evalu you are evaluated and scored based on uh, your completeness of your proposal. Technical requirements, again, are specific for each project. Uh, and that, just to name a few, that can be design specification, compatibility. It can mean overall project plan and approach. It can mean project team and their resumes. Um, again, you are specified in each solicitation. We make it crystal clear what we are looking for and what you are evaluated against. Cost evaluation. We evaluate total cost, labor, material, overhead expenses uh, to perform the work associated with the project. And um, just please keep, I just want to make a note that cost is not the final determining factor uh, when submitting a proposal. So under bid, you know, submitting a low bid and thinking, hey, I'm going to win this uh, solicitation, that's not the determining factor. We go, NIPA will generally base and award a, a, a uh, supplier based on best value. Everything that you set forth and bring to the table is what you're evaluated against. And that leads, that segues into what the bidder responsibilities are. Submit a complete, submitting a complete, well-organized proposal and addressing all of the requirements is critical to a bidder's success. Other insights include understanding the requirements, ensure your proposal addresses the requested requirements, review the RFP with a fine tooth comb, and then review it often to avoid any disqualification. Uh, we, we do welcome uh, questions during the proposal process. Those are sent um, as a request for information to us, and we will address any questions uh, pertaining to the project. But understand the requirements. Experience, that is huge. Link experience to the delivery of the contract, of the project. Experience should speak directly to the needs of the project, as you all know. Completeness and clarity, uh, that's key. Uh, ensure all required information is submitted. If requested information is referenced in other parts of your responses, note that and make that clear to us. And timeliness. Timeliness, because a lot of our projects work on deadlines and timelines and uh, everything has a due date and, and it requires, um, time is one of the, the things that are very huge for our projects to occur because certain projects would only occur during certain seasons. So timeliness, ensure all deadlines such as bid due date, bidder questions, pre-bid meetings are met in a timely manner. That is, that is a, a, very, a very huge topic for us. So as you can see, responding to the RFP standard requirements is an integral part of the proposal response. Again, as each project is unique and will require specific criteria, this will be made clear in the solicitation. And I now have the pleasure of introducing you to Victoria Daniels, and she is the manager of supplier diversity 
and with whom you all will be dealing with should you uh, have any future collaborations with us. Thank you very much. Uh, Vicki, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Victoria Daniels. I'm the manager of Supply Diversity. You can move the slide forward. Um, as you know, or may not know, Knight Point Canals has a Supply Diversity Program. What that means is we are required to um, follow New York State Executive Law 15A, which is related to the Minority and Women Owned Business Program. And that means MWBEs and New York State Executive Law 17B, which is related to service disabled veteran owned businesses. We are required to put diversity um, goal assessments on our contracts. And that varies based on the project. So we don't wholesale um, assign 15% um, MWBE goals to um, MBEs and 15% goals to WBEs or 6% goals on SDVOB projects. We look at each individual project and we assess goals based on what the project is. So for this particular project here, every single solicitation will be assessed goals based on what the work is, based on where the location is, based on the availability of subcontracting opportunities. And what we'd like you to do is have outreach to these diverse firms. And you do that by looking at the MWBE directory and the SDVOB directory, where you look for certified New York State um, certified firms. You may not find New York State certified firms. Um, so you have an opportunity to request waivers. Um, we have an understanding that many of the businesses that will be uh, reaching out and interesting in this opportunity will be small businesses. And we welcome small businesses. We welcome small businesses to work with us. Um, one of the issues that we know would be a problem may be the large insurance requirements. You have an opportunity within your bid solicitations to um, express that. And we probably can work with you to do some um, redlining of that insurance requirement. So within your bid solicitation, we'd want you to put some of that information in there. We'd like you to make the effort to reach out into the directory if you can, if you're one of the larger businesses that are gonna be bidding on this solicitation to look for um, MWBEs and SEVOBs that are in the directory. Uh, we'd also like you to look for some of the small local businesses in the communities that you can work with. That's one of the big things that our Vice President John Canal is very interested in, working with local businesses within these communities um, that we can work with, get them on the job. Some of these um, smaller businesses are M's and WBEs by nature. They're just not certified with New York State. And if they are interested in being certified in New York State, have them reach out to me. Um, Angeline can give them my um, information and we can help them to get certified. We welcome all um, local businesses. We love working with them. Um, we work for the economic growth of New York State and the local communities. So it's just not about, um, I wouldn't say it's just not about MWBEs and SDVOBs. We are looking to work with all diverse um, businesses, be their local um, MWBEs and SDVOBs. So um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to my colleague, um, Emery Kusku, who's the manager of Supplier Relationship Management Next. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Can everybody hear me well? Yes, Emery. Thank you, Nancy. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Emre Kushjo. I'm the Supplier Relations Manager for the Authority. Can we go to first slide, please? Um, today, my goal is to show you how to do business with NIPA and Canals by joining our supplier network. Um, first and foremost, you need to visit nipa.gov and sign up and access our procurement page. 
This is where NIPA and New York State Canal Corporation procurement opportunities are, opportunities are posted. Step number two will be uh, registering in Ariba Global platform. Once you complete the Ariba Global platform registration, you will also um, complete NIPA Supply Profile Questionnaire, which is located in NIPA Customer Requested Field section of your Ariba Glo Global Profile. Your registration will be reviewed by our team for approval once you complete it. Next slide, please. So, what is Ariba? I would like to talk a little bit more uh, about Ariba platform um, for those who are not familiar with it. Ariba is a cloud-based marketplace where buyers and suppliers can find each other and do business within a single network platform. New York Power Authority and Canals Corporation use the Ariba network to receive proposals electronically and negotiate contracts and manage also the relationship with its suppliers. As a supplier on Ariba network, you will be able to work with NIPA and Canals more efficiently and effectively on RFPs, RFIs, proposals, and contracts. Doing so through Ariba can save you time, money, and resources. And signing up Ariba is completely free. So what happens when everything is complete? Can we go to the next slide, please? All bits will continue to be advertised on nipa.gov slash procurement page. Supplier can, suppliers can access bidding information on here. However, you will be only able to review and download a summary of the bids. You will still need to submit your proposals through the Ariba platform. We, need, we announce bidding opportunities for all goods and services estimated at $50,000 or greater on nipa.gov. In addition to our current, bring up, current bidding opportunities, NIPA and Canals will also post its supplier outreach events on NIPA.gov, which promote economic development throughout the New York State. All bidding information can be also accessed by visiting New York State Contract Reporter, which will ultimately lead to our procurement console for bidding instructions. So thank you for listening, and now we will go to the Q&A session. Thank you, Emery. So, so Emery, we have a question here about how will uh, the suppliers be informed of upcoming RFPs? Could you explain that to them as well? Sure. When suppliers signing up for NIPA.gov procurement page, um, it will prompt the first-time signers to purchasing categories that is um, related to their products and services. So once supplier complete the registration and sign up for those purchasing categories, whenever NIPA or Canal post something on the website, as soon as it hits their category, they will receive an email notification. So they don't need to keep an eye on the website day to day. As soon as they sign up for the right purchasing categories they provide, they will be notified electronically. Great. That's why it's important that the suppliers, you know, make sure you check all the boxes that apply to you. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I see a question here. Um, Will it be a conflict, uh, Vicki, maybe you can answer this part. Uh, will it be a conflict of interest to be a sub on both the design effort and the inspection effort? Would it be a would conflict, be a conflict of interest to be a sub on a design in the wood part? And the inspection. John, the design or and the inspection. Yeah, I, I would say that that is more than likely a conflict, so yeah. stay away from that. <laughs> yes, it would be. John is absolutely correct. I will be looking at your own work. And, and, and as we said in the, in the chat, we will post all of the suppliers who attend this presentation, and we will post on the website 
to give you an opportunity to, to you know, match.com kind of thing. Um, so we will make sure we provide that information along with the presentation. So we, we also have a, a, a question about value contracts. So when we go out for a solicitation where we know we have, you know, general requirements for projects, we will go out and establish, you know, a value contract, which is very similar to a master service agreement with a supplier or a pool of suppliers. Um, and then we typically would do a mini bid once project details are known amongst those suppliers. I see a question here um, asking, will these opportunities be posted in the contract reporter or will they be released through term services contracts with NYPA or Canal Corporation. So these opportunities are posted. Um, again, as, as I mentioned, uh, we post them. The, the opportunities can be posted via um, New York State Contract Reporter and um, publicly open bids, or if you have been deemed qualified through our RFQ process, we will drive the solicitation towards the qualified pool of bidders. Now, the RQ process is public, so we're asking who qualified for these projects. And those who are qualified will submit their qualifications. And if the project uh, is, once the project is ready to be formally solicited, those qualified bidders will be contacted. Now we do, New York State Contract Reporter is our main method of um, solic uh, putting our proposals out uh, publicly. And again, it's very important, very important uh, that you also remember that we put them on our website, nipa.gov. And that's why it's important to visit our website and become a registered supplier. Because once you become a registered supplier with us and you hit the category, let's say it's design, architecture, construction. Whenever we put a proposal out looking for these services, you will get notified. So it's important for you to sign up, get registered within our REBA system, become a registered, registered supplier, so you can be notified as opposed, let's say you don't look on a Monday or look on a Tuesday. It doesn't matter that you haven't looked on a Monday or Tuesday on our website. We're gonna put it out, you'll be notified regardless. So um, that's why it's important for you to uh, become registered. And we, we really stress that, that it's the most important. It's the, key, it's the key point that we are really big on, becoming registered so you can receive all of our notifications. And as you go on the website, you can see everything else that we have posted. We have canal opportunities posted. We have NIPA opportunities posted. Everything is posted from construction to design to engineering. Everything is on our website. All right. Um, so I, I would just say, <clears throat> Maddie has a specific question about Ariba. So I ask you to reach out to Emery directly and, and he will guide you, provide you the guidance that you need. Um, we will look to add to our website uh, a little bit of a description about the projects and an approximate timeline. We'll work with Angeline and, and Adam to uh, make sure we put that on our website to give you guys some at least uh, some information about what the upcoming schedule is. This particular, you know, these projects are probably going to span over the next, you know, five years or so. Um, so we'll look to give you some sort of indication of, of timeline. Hi, this is Vicki. I also forgot to provide you guys with some information. If you're filling out your utilization plan and you've run into some problems or you're filling out the appendix C and you have some issues, we have some training videos on NYPA.gov on our RFP page that you can go to and it'll guide you through how to fill out appendix C and the utilization plan. And even if you're um, requesting a waiver, there's some information out there as well. So visit our NYPA.gov um, page under RFPs and when you get to our um, procurement page, you'll find the um, supplier webinars. There's information out there for you. 
Sorry about that. I failed to tell you that information. No problem. Thank you, Vicki. I think we're pretty much all caught up with the questions. Um, I'd just like to make one other point. When, um, when our supply base responds to these RFPs, um, you know, we would prefer that we receive exception-free bids from, from you. Um, we ask you to do that so that we're able to compare apples to apples when we do our bid proposal review. If for some reason you feel that there may be a better way of doing this that may save us money or, or um, you know, a, a different way that we, we may not have asked that you respond to the RFP, you know, with no exceptions, and, and submit an open proposal if you have any ideas that may help the project. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, John. I also would like to mention that on our website, we have an upcoming bid uh, page. So a lot of these projects during our presentation, they will be posted on our upcoming bid page. So you can have an idea. We give a brief, uh, uh, just a brief description of the project and a timeline, an estimated project timeline uh, when it's when we anticipate it uh, being formally proposed, uh, you know, openly bid for all the suppliers to review, uh, the term and length of the project, we put that on our upcoming bids page. So please visit nipa.gov for all upcoming bids and as well as our procurement opportunities that are presently posted as well. And um, uh, that is all for our questions, our Q&A today. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Again, I want to reiterate that the, the presentation will be posted on our website, on our NIPA website and our CANALS website um, for your review. Um, we apologize if anybody has joined late, but we are providing that for you to catch up. And please, we implore you to register and we hope that you can um, have future collaboration with us for these opportunities. And we look forward to doing business with you. Okay? So thank you all for joining and have a great day.